I'm going to give him the microphone and let him carry on. So I'm going to be talking about homeostatic mechanisms, and this talk was really designed to address one of the things that Randy raised in his uh, setup for this meeting is uh, how do we explain the absence of common alleles for large effects on some highly heritable diseases. I'm going to show you that they're actually quite common, as Randy actually already pointed out. And this work is in collaboration with my friend and colleague Mike Reed and uh, Janet Best at the Ohio State University. Um, homeostatic mechanisms, you well know about homeostasis in terms of temperature homeostasis. Uh, so here's in the, in, the, in the brown opossum, if you vary environmental temperature over a range of environmental temperatures, body temperature doesn't change, but the system collapses at low and, and high temperatures. Um, and if you do something about the heater, if you have a defective heater, then this, this safe zone uh, over which you can regulate correctly you know, becomes narrower and, and narrower and failure is more, more likely. Uh, homeostatic mechanisms are widespread. They're fun. When you need to speak a little more slowly, or people can get you. Okay. So homeostatic mechanisms are widespread. Um, they are occur in physiology. These are all things we're familiar with in development, growth, cell size regulation, pattern formation, and development. Uh, are have homeostatic mechanisms in me metabolism and biochemistry. We have uh, homeostatic mechanisms in a whole variety of things. So this is just a tiny list. Of, of, of really a very large universe of stabilizing mechanisms that have evolved in, in biological systems. Um, all homeostatic mechanisms are adaptations, they're evolved adaptations that stabilize phenotypes against environmental variation. And it turns out that they also have the property of stabilizing phenotypes against genetic variation. That's what I want to show you why and how that is. Okay. Um, Homeostatic mechanisms are diverse. Uh, even a small list, I'm just going to quickly, quickly run you through a couple of. Uh, you know, we have examples of product, product inhibition uh, with the right parameters for those, for those arrows. You can create very nice homeostatic plateaus. Uh, feed, for, feed forward excitation can produce uh, homeostasis, you know, in, in variants of output. So this is here, here we're here on these graphs we're showing the response of Z, you know, this, this, this variable here to, to input into the system. Um, we can have more complex parallel inhibitions where again, uh, variation depending on the parameters uh, can have, you can, you can generate a stable region uh, and variation in, in those parameters can either stretch or shrink that stable region over which the, the phenotype is sensitive or insensitive to, to environmental variation. Um, most systems, do not just have one of these mechanisms operating, but there are lots of them operating at the same time, and that helps to stabilize things. So here's a, a little diagram of one carbon metabolism uh, that I'll speak a little bit more about, and just a some short subset of regulatory interactions among all those chemicals that are, involve all those motifs that I just showed you on the previous uh, three or four slides. Um, so when I talk about one carbon metabolism, that, that reaction diagram that I just showed you, um, it is important, it's been exceptionally well studied uh, for medicine because defects in that system, again, from, this comes from epidemiology and association studies, are associated with a host of diseases, birth defects, uh, various forms of cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, neurological uh, disorders, and NIH has been pouring money into the study of the elements of the system for the past half century. And so the bits and pieces are, are extremely well understood. Uh, well enough understood that we can actually uh, take, we, we, we think we have the whole system. We, we understand this whole, this whole system. What happens if it goes wrong? Here's the diagram again. Uh, a couple of these reactions here are the initiation steps for de novo synthesis of nucleotides. So DNA synthesis and cell replication depends on that. And if things go wrong, you get uh, birth defects. Uh, there's a host of methylation reactions on this side of the diagram, among which DNA methylation, so there's the control of epigenetics. Uh, glutathione synthesis, a big antioxidant. Uh, if that goes wrong, uh, you become subject to a whole variety of, of oxidative stresses that follow from metabolism. And some of these, I just lost my, just lost my pointer. Um, and so some of these reactions are also involved in the, uh, uh, the synthesis of dopamine and serotonin, are, and defects again are associated with 
psychiatric disorders very often. So here's the, here's the system. The, 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 the purpose, the reason it's called one carbon metabolism is this system takes in uh, amino acids. No, I switched it. Oh, there we go. Okay, so it's called one carbon metabolism because the system takes in amino acids uh, from the environment, takes them into the mitochondria, strips the amino acids into methyl groups that are then exported to the cytosol and are used to manufacture uh, other, other molecules. Uh, their environmental inputs into the cycle are the amino acids, uh, you know, it just comes from, from eating. Um, and the B vitamins are cofactors for uh, almost a dozen uh, enzymes in this cycle, so vitamin, vitamin deficiencies have a big effect. Um, this system also has large effects common polymorphisms in human populations in a lot of these genes. Okay? And this is what puzzled us at the, at the very beginning, and that is if, these, if this pathway is so important and so strongly associated with this variety of diseases that I showed you the table of, how is it that we can tolerate the existence of these polymorphisms? And by large effect uh, common polymorphisms, I mean the following. So here is uh, an example of just one, two, three, four of these enzymes, uh, single you know, point mutations, polymorphisms. The effect that they have on the activity of the wild type enzyme, nox noxidon 50%, by 40%, by 70%, uh, by 75%, these are big effects, these are big functional uh, deficiencies, and they are occur at high frequencies in populations. I mean, if you look at these numbers for different populations, I mean, these are large. You might actually, you know, you might wonder whether what's the wild type allele in this Italian population, for instance, you know, because it's, 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 it's the, the defective allele is as common as the uh, as the what we think is the normal the normal allele. And so, to try to explain this, uh, what uh, Mike and I discovered is that it is not just a biochemistry diagram. It's not just a thing that you read, that you learn in, in biochemistry courses. But these systems are riddled with um, allosteric interactions where um, substrates at one part of the cycle affect the activity of enzymes somewhere else in the cycle. So these are all those feedback and feed forward and parallel inhibition reactions that I talked about. These are extremely abundant. Um, never learn about them in biochemistry. The literature is quite good on them. Um, and when we put these things into, so, 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 so what we do is we, uh, we write mathematical models for these, for these systems. Um, the mathematical models are based on ex experimental and clinical data, which for humans is extremely abundant. So we can, we, we can get lots of data uh, and lots of ways of validating the models uh, you know, against data that never went, that never went into them. So without bothering you about that, um, the, um, the critical features of this pathway are the following. There, there are these two reactions, the ICARD and the thymidylate synthase reaction, uh, that are the rate limiting steps for DNA synthesis. So if those go wrong, cells don't divide rapidly enough. Uh, there is met the methylation reactions that involve, among others, meth uh, DNA methylation. And there at the bottom of the pathway is where uh, glutathione is synthesized, which is our main, anti, our main endogenous antioxidant. And it's a defense against a whole variety of things that might come in with, with food and byproducts of metabolism. Um, so one thing that we can do with this model is to look at the effects of environmental variation. We can take our mathematical model and give it breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay? And when we do that, we do that by just adjusting the amino acid input uh, into the model that, uh, by in, in ways that you can get from the medical literature how amino acid values in the blood vary. And what happens, you can then monitor what happens to reaction rates of different enzymes and uh, the concentrations of different uh, products, of, of, of different metabolites. You can see these things vary tremendously. They're, 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 they're jerked up and down uh, as we, as we you know, ingest amino acids and, and, um, and, and digest them, except for these four reactions that I just mentioned, they're absolutely rock steady. They don't vary, they don't vary at all. Um, and we can demonstrate that that is due to some of these feedback interactions that occur, because if you look at the DNA method, this is just the, 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 red, the red curve over here, if we look at the DNA methylation reaction, 
uh, if we remove only one of those feedback interactions, now all of a sudden DNA, DNA methylation capacity starts to fluctuate with meals. Otherwise, it's quite stable, and in the, in the presence of those feedback reactions, DNA methylation capacity remains constant, independent of the supply rate of methyl groups for DNA methylation. It's kind of a nice, nice feature. So, the, the, so, so, so the one, one important thing I need to point out about this is that the stability of these, these phenotypes, as we call them, is not because the system is at steady state. These are dynamically maintained phenotypes. They're dynamically maintained steady. And the system is working like crazy, like in all homeostatic systems, to maintain that, that, that constancy. And that, that, that's a really important thing to, to recognize. But we can, we can look at it in, in another way. This is one of the slides that, that sort of precedes the one that Randy just showed you. Um, and that is we can look at the steady states of the system as well and then ask how do these steady states depend on uh, variation in the, uh, in, in the variables of the system. And here we're plotting, for instance, the activity of thymidylate synthase, that is that rate limiting step for DNA synthesis, and the uh, MTHFR, which is another enzyme in the system. And we ask the question, how does the value of homocysteine or the ICART reactions, or in this case, the thymidylate synthase as a function of methionine synthase or an MTHFR, how does that activity vary as these underlying uh, genes vary. And all these landscapes are highly nonlinear. They have these really nice flat plateaus. Those are our homeostatic, our homeostatic plateaus, uh, in which variation in, in the activity of these enzymes has little or no effect on, the, on, this, out, on this output. Okay? And this is, again, all due to, um, due to these, these uh, allosteric uh, regulatory interactions. Back again briefly to this table, um, I showed you what the effects of these, these um, what the effects of these, these mutations are on these various uh, on these various enzymes. And once we have that, we can actually plot those mutations on these landscapes. So these are the same the, you know, the, the, you know, the same values I just showed you in the table now plotted on these phenotypic landscapes. And you can see that most of those mutations fall in the relatively horizontal, the relatively flat regions of the landscape where variation in these, in these genes has no f effect on the, on the phenotype. So these are buffered against genetic variation okay, at the steady state. So just like the steady state is buffered against dynamic variation with, with meals. Okay? There's another really interesting thing about this, and that is, for instance, this methionine synthase reaction. So, 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 so this is the, uh, the, 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 the enzyme that, that you know, picks up methyl groups and passes them to make, to make methionine. So we think of, of uh, genetic variation, polymorphic variation in this enzyme on this axis, but vitamin B12 is a cofactor for methionine synthase. So this variation in activity of this enzyme could also be thought of as variation in the availability of vitamin B12. And if I look around this room, I think about a third of us are not at the 100% level. Uh, as we get older, as you get to be above about 65 years or so, uh, you start developing uh, B12 deficiencies. Okay? You gradually move in that direction down this landscape uh, because you know, we, we simply absorb vitamin B12 very, very poorly. So, so this view actually puts genetic variation and environmental variation on the same footing. We can understand it within these models uh, you know, very, very, very easily um, and, uh, and um, sort of interpret why it is that certain things go wrong. Okay. So how do these landscapes depend on those feedback interactions? By simply taking out one of those feedback interactions, this is what happens to the landscape. These gray, landsca these gray landscapes are the ones I just showed you. That is with all <coughs> feedback interactions present. You, only, you knock out only one of those and that landscape tilts. And now this genetic variation that was formerly on a horizontal plane now becomes sitting on a tilted landscape, now it becomes phenotypic. Now all of a sudden those bad, those, those big, large effect functional mutations at the mechanistic, at the, at the, sort of at the, at the functional level, now become evident at the phenotypic level. What are the shadows again? So the shadows are these landscapes. No, I mean on the next slide, the, the, the second curve, the second surface. The yeah, so, 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 so the, 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 gray, the gray surface is the, the intact landscape 
in the presence of these regulatory interactions. If you break one of those, then here is the surface that remains, the surface now becomes tilted. So in other words, you, the homeostasis doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't occur anymore. Okay? Um, and so this, this variation, this is what evolutionary biologists call, call cryptic genetic variation. Okay? It's, it's cryptic at the phenotypic level. In other words, you can tolerate these mutations without uh, having a phenotypic uh, effect. But if something goes wrong, either an environmental shift, you know, vitamin B12, or a, a mutation, then all of a sudden the, these, these, these mutations can become evident uh, because the landscapes get tilted. Um, here's another effect. If we, if we for instance, give, a, give this model a vitamin B12 deficiency, here we're looking at the methylation capacity, DNA methylation capacity. There are the polymorphisms. Uh, there's that same landscape again. We give it a vitamin B12 deficiency. The landscape tilts, and now all of a sudden, these previously fairly neutral polymorphisms now become very large at the phenotypic level. Um, just one other example, one thing that we've done quite a bit of work on is dopamine metabolism. Here the feedbacks are uh, accomplished by the dopamine reuptake transporter, uh, which is over here, and there's a feedback via a presynaptic autoreceptor that affects some of the reactions in the cycle. In the presence of the uh, dopamine reuptake uh, transporter, we get the system is fairly insensitive to cell death. This is in for the substantia nigra. You can kill off about 80% of the cells without affecting dopamine level very much. But in the absence of high activity of this dopamine reuptake transporter, uh, the system is not stable at all. You get, you get a big effect on dopamine uh, synthesis. Uh, the genes in uh, tyrosine hydroxylase and the dopamine reuptake transporter have polymorphisms in them that have tremendous effects on their activity. Uh, but because of these regulatory, you know, these feedback interactions, again, where most of the most of these occur in a in a region where there's fairly little effect on um, on the uh, on the dopamine levels in the in the synaptic cleft. Uh, and again, we can look at this landscape. So it's again, so it's this gray landscape that I just showed you. Uh, if we take um, if we take uh, vary the effect of the autoreceptor, we reduce the effect of the autoreceptor, that landscape tilts again. And so this is again a way of showing that a defect somewhere else in the system you know, can greatly affect how the, the phenotype, in this case extracellular dopamine levels, respond to genetic variation. And I think I'm out of time. Uh, so I'll stop, I'll stop right there. With, and, and, and these are the conclusions. Uh, homeostatic mechanisms stabilize phenotypes. Therefore, mutations with large effect at the functional level can have very small effects at the phenotypic level. And that allows the accumulation of mutations within that homeostatic plateau, which is what we think of as, um, as cryptic genetic variations. And I think that mutations that affect health and have large effect at the functional level are common. It's just that they don't have large effects at the phenotypic level, okay, because they're being buffered. And environmental shift or other mutations in the system can destabilize these homeostatic mechanisms. And when that happens, that then these genotypes that are near some homeostatic cliff, like these guys over here, not, which we can think of as these, these guys as are predisposed to disease, they don't have disease, necessarily, but if something happens, they're so close to the cliff that now, you know, disease phenotypes will, will, will arise. And I think I'll stop there, and thank you very much. And the next speaker up in front of the room, so we can get your presentation set up. So, so to paraphrase what you're saying, these large variation effects actually exist because they can. They're, they're not under selection because the systems are tolerant to absorb this huge amount of genetic alteration? Yeah, since selection is on phenotypes and the mutations don't affect the phenotype, they're, they're, they're not under selection or under weak selection, and so that, that allows them to, to be there and accumulate. And I guess, could you, would you speculate whether there's an alternate, yeah, the alternative forms of these, do they combine in any other way to produce other phenotypes other than disease phenotypes in the context of perhaps this evolutionary medicine? Uh, right, could, 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 could they buffer, for instance? Um, no, we haven't looked at that, but one thing that these, these models show is that you can tolerate mutations in one or two of these feedbacks, but the more you add, the more tilted that landscape becomes, and so that, that's where, yeah, where these multi-hit you know, models could come in. Yeah, good.
Are there polymorphisms that are close to a cliff edge, either less common or having less effect on the phenotype? Uh, in what we, in, in the ones that we have sampled, that, that we don't see that. No. But, you know, the, da the data are not, not terrific, so. Um, having argued over the years, not against homeostasis, I, I wrote a book called Allostasis, which is mm -hmm. a term invented by a colleague of mine, Peter Sterling, that many systems are not necessarily titrated to um, maintaining one, mm -hmm. two, or four set of values. You know, sodium, calcium, the whole range of things. Do you, you account for the, I mean, you don't have to use allostasis or rheostasis or there's four or five other terms other than homeostasis, but mm -hmm. many systems are also anticipatory, so they vary their range depending upon the context. How does that get mm -hmm. into your system? Well, those are the reactions that, in, in our system, those are the, the ones that actually maintain those few critical things that you want to maintain constant. Those things just vary all over the place, but they vary in response to environmental or genetic variables. Yeah, so that would account for that. Thank you, Fred.